Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, and uh, it's a great honor to be with all of you. Uh, I am sorry I cannot be uh, physically with you, uh, but I'm glad at least we are able to communicate uh, via uh, online. The uh, topic I was asked to talk about is the chances for peace given the very dark moment that we are going through in the history of modern Palestine which of course is not an easy topic to talk about because our efforts, our emotions, our sentiments are all directed as they should be directed towards stopping the genocide in Gaza, which is the most important thing. And although the level of Israeli operations is not the same as it was in the last six months, the killing continues also in the West Bank and the starvation continues and the lack of basic uh, infrastructure for hospitals, schools and families at large is still there and we are facing unfortunately an imminent attack on Rafa. So this is not over yet and our efforts towards doing whatever we can to pressure our governments, our international organization to stop these operations is still very acute, very urgent, and every day is too late in many ways. But it is also important to talk, in a way, on the day after. And I think that there are two days after, so to speak. There's a day after in the not-so-distant future, uh, with, if we're looking towards a year or two years from now. And there, I'm afraid, uh, whatever one can see from our vantage point today is not very promising. However, the Israelis would declare the end of the military operation that they have started six months ago, uh, and given the fact that probably they will not be able to defeat the Hamas the way they wanted, or as they called it, to uproot the Hamas from Gaza, and given the fact that uh, the international community would not change dramatically its position towards Israel, and without really knowing how the current conflict in the north of Israel between Hezbollah and Israel would unfold, given all these elements, it seems that the next year or two uh, are a bit uh, would be the same as this year, if not worse in many respects. Unfortunately, it's a very dark prediction, a very pessimistic prediction, but I'm afraid it's a realistic one. So that's one day after. How exactly uh, in that day after, the short term day after, so to speak, uh, Israel would still be the power that be in the Gaza Strip. How, what would it do with Gaza? Also not that easy to predict because there are two schools of thought within the Israeli government. One is led by the more messianic, fanatic, extreme elements of the government uh, who originally come from the Jewish settlements in the West Bank. And as far as they are concerned, this operation has to end with the return, as they call it, of Jewish settlers to the Gaza Strip, especially to the north of the Gaza Strip. And uh, the ethnic, ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians to the southern part of the Strip, and if possible, outside the Strip, to Egypt, 
or to anywhere else in the world if they can have their way and if anybody would collaborate with them. The more pragmatic uh, uh, camp within that government uh, has a bit of a different vision for the day after. They would like to bring in the Palestinian Authority or something similar to the Palestinian Authority into the Gaza Strip uh, to replace the Hamas as the regime in the Strip and also to annex a certain part directly, especially that part which is close to the Jewish uh, settlements that were attacked on the 7th of October to annex that part to Israel so as to distance more those settlements from uh, the Gaza Strip itself. And uh, they hope that this operation would be supported both diplomatically and financially, not only by the United States and the West, but also by Arab countries such as Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and, and uh, other Gulf uh, states. As for the first scenario that the Messianic fanatic Jews want to implement in Gaza, I think that this would uh, not work because the Palestinian resistance would continue. And even if for a moment or two this will succeed, I think that this would hopefully accelerate the process of which I will talk in a moment, by which maybe we will see in the longer run a fundamental change in the way the international community uh, reacts to Israel's policies uh, on the ground. Uh, as for the second scenario of bringing back the PA into the Gaza Strip and taking away some of the Gaza Strip and annexing it to Israel, I'm afraid they have the power to do it. I don't know if the, uh, there will be members of the PA who would be willing to do it. This is not clear yet. But this is a more feasible uh, a, a scenario, not a good one, not a moral one, not a just one, and not one that would hold on for a long time. But we have to be ready that this is the kind of process that the international community, and particularly the West, will support in the next year or two in Gaza. But if we look beyond the next year and the year after, which is very difficult if you are living in Gaza, if you are a refugee from Gaza, or even you live in the West Bank. But uh, maybe it's the luxury of people like ourselves who are not suffering directly from that oppression that we can have the uh, uh, ability and the space, more importantly than the ability, to think a little bit beyond the next year or the year after. And that vision, to my mind, is more optimistic from the point of view of the Palestinians, their aspirations for liberation, independence, for ending occupation, colonization, ethnic cleansing, and God forbid, another chapters of genocide. The reason I'm saying this is that in the long run, you can see processes that are happening inside Israel, in the Palestinian community, in the region, and in the world, that if they are moving in the way that I think they are moving, together, they can create a very different reality on the ground uh, in Palestine. So let me point to some of these processes that make me more optimistic about the long-term future. And as I want, I, I, I am afraid I have no good news for the next year or two. The first process is the one that is undergoing within the Israeli a Jewish society, a process that already began before the 7th of October. 
one which has very little to do with the Palestinians themselves. It is much more linked to the inability of uh, the Israeli Jewish society to, found, to find a common basis on which to define what does it mean to be a Jewish national community, or what does it mean to be part of Jewish nationalism in the 21st century. The uh, difference between the view of the more religious, the more messianic, the more traditional Jews in Israel, and the view of the more secular, mostly a people from a European origin Jews, the views are so different that the only thing that brings them together and creates some sort of a cement that keeps them together is the external danger, the fact that there is a common enemy or that you believe that you have no choice but to work together, otherwise you will be extinct, destroyed or defeated. But uh, this is not uh, a, a recipe for a long-term existence in the modern world. What we learned is that the, uh, the way that these two camps see life in the future Jewish state is so different from one another that actually to implement their idea of how a Jewish state should look like, they have to impose it by force on the other side. And that's why we had these very violent clashes already before the 7th of October, and they are now resumed because relatively the action in Gaza from an Israeli perspective had decreased and all these internal tensions have now erupted again and surfaced. Uh, and this kind of cold civil war uh, continues and I think will implode the Jewish society from within. Another process that we were aware of, mostly because of the 7th of October, but actually was already very clear in 2000, when Hezbollah was able to force Israel to withdraw from Lebanon, that the Israeli army is not invincible, does not always have the power to defend its own citizens, and that for the long run, if a country wants to rely for its existence only on its military success, uh, this, is some, this is a horizon that it doesn't even matter if it is correct that Israel would always eventually come out with uh, the upper hand in military confrontation, even if this is true, which I doubt anyway, but even if it, this is true, this is not something you can sell to your own population in the long run. People in 21st century don't want to think that the, last, the next 50 years are just years of bloodshed, violence, and war. And that creates a, 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 an immigration in large number of people who can afford it, uh, a lack of confidence in democracy, in politics, and you become more and more a, an army with a state rather than a state with an army. A third process is the inability of the government in such moments of crisis, as has been very clear in the last six months. And these moments of crisis, according to the Israelis' predictions themselves, would repeat themselves again and again. In these moments of crisis, the government or the state as a provider of services is not working. The only uh, uh, groups that were able to help the Israelis who had to leave the south of Israel and those who had to leave the north of Israel, who became internal refugees in their own state, the only groups that were effective were those who belonged to the civil society. Again, you can sustain such a behavior for a, a short term, but not in the long term. Another process is the economic situation. A future that entails one conflict after the other, that requires huge amount of money, of defense and for aggression, 
uh, is not something that makes an economic system viable. And that would come at the expense of providing services to the uh, society on the one hand, and as we already have seen, to, uh, a, uh, to a lot of investors from the outside to distance themselves from investing in a state that constantly provides insecurity in terms of financial uh, investments. You can add to this, for instance, the inability or the uh, unwillingness, sorry, unwillingness of most um, airliners, airlines today to fly to Israel. Another process which is important is the growing isolation uh, of Israel in, in the world, including in the West and even in the uh, United States. Uh, the Israeli newspaper Haaretz had uh, two consecutive uh, uh, reports which were very interesting. One about the level of the academic boycott on Israel and the other one on the level of the cultural boycott on Israel. And according to these reports in the newspaper Haaretz, the, uh, both boycott campaigns have reached such a level that uh, it seems that it is now widespread, effective, and uh, uh, really sends a very powerful message to the academic and cultural elites of Israel that if Israel would continue the way it does, they would not be welcomed anywhere apart from pariah states, other pariah states. This is not sanctions. This is not the kind of policies that help to bring down the apartheid regime in South Africa, but this is a very important development compared to where these campaigns were, let's say, 15, 20 years ago, when they began. This process can be also compared to another process, which is the change among the Jewish communities in their attitude towards Zionism. The younger Jewish generation, including in the United States, sees itself less and less as Zionist, less and less committed. In the case of the young generation in the United States, it's even more than that. It's not just not showing interest anymore of being the lobby for Israel. It is being actively involved in the solidarity movement with the Palestinians. And many of these young Jews and non-Jews who are marching for Palestine in the United States, maybe in the future be in positions to influence policies as politicians, as business people, as academics, uh, and so on. And this is an important process. Finally, I would add to this the changes within the Palestinian society, which are not easy to detect. Because if you look at the Palestinian political scene today, you don't see any promise for the future, to be honest. There is political disunity, fragmentation. Uh, when un one can understand the objective reasons for that situation, but one cannot deny its existence. But I think that we tend to forget how young the Palestinian society in general is. It is one of the youngest societies in the world. And the younger Palestinian uh, generation is far more united in its vision. I think it's less affected by affiliations to political factions and parties. I think it has a much clearer vision for the future, uh, for the liberation itself, and how the country should look after the liberation, and how to get to the liberation. It's still not an organized uh, energy. It's a very strong energy, but it's not organized yet. Uh, and therefore, I think it's not heard enough and it's not influencing as yet Palestinian politics. But I think it will in the future. And uh, this would be an important impact to have a clear united Palestinian statement of what the Palestinians want and how do they want to get there 
and what is their vision for the future. We're not there yet, but I do believe this is going to happen, in the ne not in the near future, but in a more distant future. So if I take all these processes together, I see a situation by which we see the beginning of the end of the Zionist project in Palestine. Uh, I, not, I do not know, I'm not a prophet, when it will happen. I don't know exactly how it will happen, but I'm quite sure it will happen. And the question is, of course, what happens when this collapse that I'm talking about uh, is taking place, however it will take place, because nobody can predict how it will take place. The problem is that it will create a void, a, a vacuum. And the question is, would in that historical moment the Palestinian National Movement be ready to fill the vacuum? That would be very important to make sure that this negative process becomes a positive one. And another thing we should pay attention to is that these processes of collapse or disintegration or weakening can be very long and very dangerous because the regime that is under the danger of disintegrating uses ruthless methods to keep it alive. And therefore it's a very worrying period as well. But I do think it carries promise. There were other indications, I don't have time to go all to them, I would just mention them uh, uh, in a telegraphic way. I don't think the Americans would always be the dominant power, definitely not in the Middle East. It's good to look at other powers and their influence. Uh, I do think that the global societies can do more in influencing the governments and maybe that would happen as well. But all in all, I think the more important indications are the one I have uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, this is something that, and with this I will end, this is not uh, something that we should watch and wait for it to happen. For many of the processes I was talking about, we can contribute. We can be part of these processes. We are not onlookers. We are not innocent onlookers. We are part of these processes, and we should find a way of participating in making them positive and constructive processes rather than destructive ones. Because the one thing the history of decolonization in places like Africa and Southeast Asia teaches us that it doesn't always bring uh, good news with it or better realities for the people who live there. So I think that's also very important to be part of it, each wherever they come from and whoever they are, and not to give up the hope that our accumulative hope uh, efforts will not only hopefully end very soon the horrific situation in Gaza, and let us not forget the horrific situation in the West Bank as well, but also that we should have hope that even a more uh, dramatic process of liberation and decolonization would happen in our lifetime, or at least in the lifetime of our children. Thank you very much.